Hello and welcome to the Student Council Podcast, an educational advice show made for students and by students. My name is Carter Dvorak, and today I am so excited to be joined by sociology professor, Professor Terrence McGinn from the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for being on here. I am very excited to talk to you. I'd love to hear what have been your favorite five minutes of the past week. I think probably my favorite five minutes of this week was I have a friend who's in the hospital and uh Somebody else is technically taking care of her cat, but I went over to check on the cat and the cat can be kind of standoffish, but the cat knows me. So I walked in and there's a chair that if I sit in that chair, the cat may come sit in my lap. I went over, sat down in the chair and the cat came racing across the room and jumped into my lap and just plopped down there and then fell asleep. So that made me feel good that the cat was getting a little attention from somebody it knew uh, in the absence of its owner. So that was a nice five minutes. Absolutely. A, a cat is, is a wonderful animal. I had to learn to be a cat person. I, I, I grew up as a more of a dog person, but I, I've developed an appreciation for cats in more recent years. Yeah, I think that like, I, I enjoy dogs. I kind of had, I definitely was the inverse. So we grew up as kind of a cat household and like, it took me a while to kind of like get comfortable around certain kinds of dogs. But now there are definitely dogs that I do love as well. So yeah, they're very sweet. Now, I, I really curious you. So I was in your sociology music class and I had a wonderful experience with it. Now we'll talk, we'll talk more about that course later, but you have a very extensive history at the University of Michigan as both a lecturer and a student. I'm really curious how you first became acquainted with the school and kind of like what fostered your connection with U of M. Yeah, so um, I started out in a career in ministry. I was uh, uh, on the staff of a, a, a large church over in Gross Point, and I decided after a few years there that I needed, uh, I wanted more training in pastoral counseling, the kinds of counseling that clergy do with their parishioners. And there was a program at the University of Michigan Hospital specifically in that. It's called Clinical Pastoral Education, and it's a national program for certifying this kind of counseling. So I came to Ann Arbor actually to go to the hospital to be in this training program for clergy. But I think as with some other people who come to Ann Arbor, many others, I stayed. So I was in the program for a while. Uh, but as I was here, I got involved with a church and had been thinking about doing a doctorate. And it was sort of like, OK, you're in Ann Arbor. Where better? And so I went from the clinical training program at the hospital uh, into a Ph.D. program. So my first actual I did not do undergraduate work here. Uh, my first degree at Michigan was a Ph.D. Wow, that's really interesting. And was that a Ph.D. like focusing on sociology then? or were you focusing PhD? It was wise? not. It was a PhD in higher education administration hmm. because at that time, what I had intended to do was uh, look at becoming an administrator in a seminary or a religious college. Uh, after I got the PhD, things took a turn, but but that was what I was trying to do. So I was in the Center for the Study of Higher Education, uh, which is a, a very strong unit over uh, in the ed school. And uh, my doctoral dissertation was on organizational change in institutions of higher education. Really interesting. And, I, and I'm curious, um, like, so how did you wind up then leading into sociology? Where did that kind of come from? <laughs> Okay, so while I was getting my PhD, there was someone teaching sociology of religion in the sociology department who was very interested in this course that he was teaching, personally interested in religion, but had no strong academic background in religion. He was just a PhD, so I'm not just, but he was a PhD sociologist. And he was introduced to me and said, while you're a student in your PhD program, could I get you to come and grade for me in my sociology of religion class? So I was like, yeah, great. So I came over and graded for him a few times while I was getting my PhD. And then I went on in life and ended up in business and came back to the University of Michigan to get my MBA. And while I was here getting my MBA, I got a call and they said, this professor has had a heart attack. Uh, We were maybe a quarter of the way into the semester, a third of the way into the semester. And they said, is there any chance, because you know the course, that you could take over the course and finish it? And it just so happened that the timing of the course fit with in the classes I was taking at the business school. So I taught, and he actually was well enough to come back partway through the semester. So we co-taught of sociology of religion. And that was my first teaching in the sociology department. After that, he no longer wanted to teach that course. So then they approached me and said, would you come just as sort of a one-off and teach this course? And they invited me, you know, like every other year, I would come and teach sociology of religion. And then one by one, they started adding courses until I, after many years, ended up full-time on the faculty. Wow. 
That's incredibly interesting. So you did you also you finish your MBA program as well then? I didn't know you had any experience with the, the business school. Oh, yes. I have a degree from the Ross before it was the Ross. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's very cool. And then I, I am curious before we dive like too deep into sociology, because I'm really interested in it. Maybe for somebody like I was, it was interesting. I was talking about this class on social media and somebody commented like, oh, I, I'm going into sociology class and I don't have any experience with it. I don't know what to expect. So would you mind describing kind of what people expect in a sociology course, maybe just an intro to sociology or like sociology of religion, because I'm curious about that too. And like what the general gist of the field is. I know it's a, a very complicated subject as we've learned, but. So, so what you might remember is that sociology is a low consensus field. Yep. We don't agree on much of anything, including the definition of sociology. So I will give you a definition of sociology and any sociologists who listen will say that's not right and they'll have their own definition of sociology. Uh, but one way to think about sociology is that it explores social realities that are larger than the individual in an attempt to understand human behavior from the perspective of those larger social realities. Or another way that I like to say it is sociology studies the power of groups, the power of groups over their members, the power of groups over each other, and the power of groups within the larger society. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I love taking the, the intro to sociology course or the music one that we had. It was fascinating to like really learn about all of that. And I'm curious coming at sociology with, with a religious background and still being like, you know, a pastor and a minister, like what, how do you balance those two ideas? I've been really curious about that of like, you know, do you find that your views on religion affect sociology and your views on sociology affect the way that you preach? Like, you know, it just seems like interesting concepts to kind of meld together. Um, so when I'm... Uh, teaching sociology, the religion is typically not involved. That That is part of my private life. That's privatized. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it's in my bio, so people will read it. And uh, there was one year I was teaching sociology of religion, and I, I was making some comment that was negative about religion. And I think it surprised some of the students in the class that somebody who had the kind of religious connections I have could say something critical about religion. So all of a sudden, these three hands, boom, bing, bing, went up together in the back of the room. They'd apparently been chatting. And I said, yeah. And, and the question was, exactly how religious are you? Oh. <laughs> it's like, I don't exactly know how to answer that. But in, in my teaching, um, the religion is privatized. It's, it's not, it shouldn't be present in any significant way other than content knowledge when I'm teaching sociology of religion. On the other hand, the other way around, sociology has been very helpful for me in religion because it has helped me to think about um, social justice issues and uh, to think about what is the obligation of religion in addressing social justice issues. So I would say that my um, emphasis on social justice is much more significant now than it was before I uh, came into sociology. That's really interesting. Also, like, did you find could, having a little bit of kind of like experience in like teaching and grading sociology courses after you're getting your MBA, did you find that it affected your business practices at all? Or were those sociology? Kind of, yeah. Yes. Because when I was in business, what eventually ended up happening in business, I, I was in a corporate environment for a while as a human resources person. So uh, it was helpful in that. But I eventually ended up in a consultant practice where my emphasis was on uh, the selection and development of senior leaders in organizations. And one of the very important things when you're working with senior leaders is helping them to think about organizational culture. And what is your organizational culture? Does it align with what you're trying to do? You need to make changes in your culture to get better alignment so you can move the organization forward. And sociology is certainly about culture. Uh, so yes, sociology was helpful to me as I helped uh, senior leaders of organizations to think about their organizational cultures. Yeah, I, I could totally see how those make sense. I'm also curious, sociology of music, the, the, the course that I took with you, what has been your experience teaching that courses over the years? I know you've done it more than once. And like, what do you generally find really interesting about that? The thing I came away from this year that I feel like I've got to do more of when I teach it next, and I think it's being offered again in the fall, is, you know, when I teach a course, I often start out with, okay, what's important to communicate to the students? How do I organize that? What's the narrative I'm trying to get at? You know, what's the story I'm trying to tell with this course and so on and so forth. And I think I've gotten comfortable enough with that now that I want to back away from it a little bit and spend more time at the beginning. It, I, I became aware partway through the course that, that 
there were varieties of things that students were bringing to this in terms of their own exposure to music. So mm -hmm. we had professional musicians in there, and I've almost always had uh, students from you know the School of Music, Theater, and Dance in that class, um, and and th and they're taking it in on one level. But then there are other students who you know are are there because they love popular music, and there are other students who are there because of something from their childhood and lessons they took as a kid or whatever. Uh, so I think what I want to try to do, and I'm not exactly sure how this will work, is to spend more time at the very beginning trying to understand where are these students coming from? Because it's very different than in a sociology course where everybody's taking it because it's social theory and you've got to have it because by the time you get through your major, you have to understand this stuff. People are coming at this as an elective from a variety of backgrounds. So uh, that's what I took away from it this time is I need to work more at the front end to figure out what are people bringing, what are they looking for, and how can I, even though I've already got a syllabus in front of them, craft that syllabus with enough openness in it that we can address those individual issues and perspectives. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting way. And it's a really, I think, really cool style of teaching of really getting the student engagement because I love that class because, you know, I loved all learning all the sociology content. I loved all the conversations we had because so many people had so many different perspectives that they brought into it. Yeah, like further, I'm curious, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this semester you're teaching a sociology and digital studies course, right? I am. How is that then? <laughs> what do you found interesting about that one as well? I was hoping to take it, but there were some scheduling conflicts, but. I am. I'm hoping that they will find somebody younger to teach <laughs> that course because the some of the pop culture stuff is is harder for me to to keep up with. Uh, now I learn. I mean, for better or worse, I I learn. But uh, it that course is a is different every time I teach it. There's new stuff, new things going on. So I'll, I'll give you a, a for instance. Last night I discovered what a, what borging is. Do you know mm -hmm. what borging is? I, I believe so. Yeah. This, this is a drinking thing, right? Yes. Yeah. I've never heard of this. I'm sure every student on the campus of the University of Michigan knows this. So the struggle for me with the, the digital studies course isn't um, the sociology of it. It's the mm -hmm. pop culture references. Um, so what I have this semester that's been very helpful is I have a grad student who is um, um, very sophisticated about uh, the internet and, and technical things who is kind of helping to bridge that for me. Um, and I say to the students, look, there are things I'm not gonna know that you're gonna know. Uh, you're mm -hmm. gonna know the pop culture stuff that I don't know, and that's fine. My job isn't really to know all the pop culture stuff, it's to help you think about what you can understand more using the sociological perspective. And one of the questions we ask is, given the fact that the sociological perspective was largely developed before the digital age, is it still relevant? Are the things that so sociology discovered earlier still applicable in the digital age? Or do we need new ways of thinking in this new era? So um, yes, that's what I'm teaching right now. Mm -hmm. And it's, the, it's the, the course that's, I just always feel like I struggle to keep up with it. Certainly. I mean, sometimes I think I struggle to keep up with, with the, the everything happening in the world. Things happen very quickly. I think you find like, cause I've tried to, you know, sometimes I'll take like social media breaks for, for mental health or things like that. And then I feel like you log back on sometimes and it's like, oh, there's been three new words invented in the yeah. last two weeks. Um, you know, and it, and that's always an interesting experience as well. Uh, switching gears a little bit, I when I was kind of doing my 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 research for this episode, I found you have like a a really interesting and prolific history in like music and the performing arts from like starting I think six years old is what I read. Like, are there any like really big highlights from those experiences? Any ways that you find those kind of still affect your day to day life today? Music is much more avocational than vocational for me other than uh, having enough background to be able to offer the sociology of music course. But uh, if I was gonna point to two things that were sort of fun for me along the way in terms of music, they're performance related. Um, one is that uh, when I first came to Ann Arbor, uh, I did a number of community theater musicals, uh, sort of made a circuit and did a lead uh, or two for each of the major uh, musical theater groups in the community in Ann Arbor, not the university, but in the community. And so that was really fun for me to do a few years of, of musical theater while I was getting my PhD and other things. Um, the other thing that would be, that's been a real highlight for me is much more recent, which is I wanted to 
get more theory um, and more history than I had had before. I'd had a lot of you know, piano lessons, voice lessons, uh, performance experiences, but I didn't have the theoretical grounding and I wanted that. So I looked around and I, I, I never do anything academic unless I can get a degree. As you, as you know, I have five degrees. So I'm like, okay, where can I get a degree in music that's not gonna be four years and so forth? And I ended up deciding to get an associate's degree in music at Lansing Community College, which has a fine program uh, in music and it has a number of dimensions, but the only one where I could really get what I wanted in terms of the history and theater was a performance degree. So at the age of 65, I started a, a, a degree in vocal performance performance uh, at Lansing Community College. And I think the highlights of that for me were every semester, 50% of my grade uh, in my in my voice courses was juries. It's like a final exam. We have to stand up in front of the faculty and, and, and perform and sing in foreign languages and, and, and things like that. And, and because I was older, the, the faculty adjusted and did some things that were uh, special for me and in some cases more challenging. So as a freshman, I was singing in Russian, which is uh, unusual. Um, but uh, those juries were a wonderful experience because I came out of them feeling like I've learned something, I've accomplished something. I got up in front of this faculty and didn't and, and did well. I didn't didn't make a, you know foolish mistakes and stuff. So that was probably the other highlight for me out of out of personal music stuff. It's my my juries uh, and 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 music majors would go, oh my gosh, the man's crazy that he liked his juries. I did. That's incredibly cool. And I, and I think that goes to some experiences of, I was talking to another a high school teacher a while earlier, and he was talking about like, when he was getting his master's, like how, how he kind of had a newfound appreciation for like education and teaching and things that he hadn't felt like earlier on in his career. And so I think that's something to be said of doing education later in life when you've really realized like the benefit, the value of it more. Well, and it did give me a chance to be a student, a college mm -hmm. student, and to see the experience again through the eyes of students. And that was helpful. Um, I'm not sure I re I'm not sure I retained all of it. In other words, when I came back to being uh, a, a, an instructor again, I think I first and foremost have an instructor's perspective. But mm -hmm. I, I, I did I did gain some 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 things from being a college student again at this point. Yeah, that that's certainly cool. I am also curious. Um, kind of speaking of music, has you have you had like a, a piece of music or a song that's kind of made an impact on you or that you really enjoy listening to? Yes. Uh, I, I don't listen to it so much anymore, but mm -hmm. uh, when I grew up in a very rural area where there was no real exposure to classical music, and in my little Baptist church, we had this little Baptist hymnal. And in this hymnal was a hymn called, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, which was based on a Bach chorale. And it was my first exposure to classical music. And for whatever reason, you know, somebody may be able to explain this better than I can, but I heard that Bach piece as a child and just instantly resonated with it. I mean, it was, I thought this is such beautiful music. And that was my introduction to classical music in and in a place where there really wasn't other opportunity for, for classical music. So uh, for me, that song is very special because it whetted my appetite for the classics in music, uh, which have become important to me over time. Certainly, that's a really uh, that's a really interesting thing to hear. I think it's so special when you can find like yeah these little introductory moments into like genres that people love. It's it's cool to kind of piece that back to where it first started. Now, I'm also curious. I love asking people like the next couple questions I ask all my guests, and I think it's really fun. But the first one is, what is the most impactful piece of advice that somebody gave to you? Okay. Here you go. This takes a minute. Okay. The advice was, there's a setup on this as a premise. Often in life, we experience a gap between our self-image, how we perceive ourselves and how we think we're doing, mm -hmm. versus our self-ideal, how we think we should be doing. Yeah. And that gap can cause depression and anger and other kinds of bad feelings. So you 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 want to narrow that gap. You your ideal of yourself will always be a little ahead of your image of yourself, but you don't want that gap to get too big. So the advice was that what a lot of people want to do when there's that gap is work harder so that their self image comes up. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to make myself better and I'll get closer to my self ideal. And this person said, this expert said, that is least often the way that you ought to proceed to correct. Some, yes, there may be some situations where you just need to work harder, but most often that's not the solution. He said the second thing that people will do is realize that there are some flaws 
in the way they're seeing themselves, that their perception of themselves is inaccurate. And so the second thing people will do is try to see that they actually are already closer to their self-ideal than they think they are. And, he, and this person said, that is the second best thing to do. But he said, the most often the thing that really needs to happen when there's a gap between self-ideal and self-image is you need to bring down the self-ideal. Too often we are expecting too much of ourselves and we need to bring that down. Now that isn't always the case, but he just said in terms of which is most likely to be the thing that needs to happen, most likely is when there's a gap between self-image and self-ideal, you need to bring down the self-ideal, come closer to where you actually are. I thought that piece of advice has been very, very useful in many, many ways over time. Absolutely. I love that that whole the whole premise, the whole setup is is phenomenal. It's a really important piece of advice, I think, both for for people kind of going entering into college and that world and interest in general in life. That's a wonderful piece of advice. So that's amazing. Now, now similar to that, but a little bit different is, do you have an ultimate tip for somebody that's going into college or kind of beginning that part of their lives? So this is a little presumptuous, right? Because I, I haven't been a starting undergrad. Well, you know, I just did an associate's degree. Yeah. But um, it's not the ultimate piece of advice. I, I, I wouldn't know how to come up with an ultimate one. But one thing I would mm -hmm. say to today's college students is don't try to do everything in four years. Part of what I think college is supposed to be about is reflecting. And if you are so busy doing, 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 double major, triple major, extracurriculars to put on my resume, uh, internships, you know, if you're so busy doing, you, you miss the important opportunity of reflecting. And so my advice would be make sure that you leave enough time for reflection in college. I love that piece of advice. I think it is really important. It's funny. I think in high school, too, there's that tendency of like, oh, I've got to, you know, get everything ready to apply to colleges. And then I think it's really hard to not kind of still latch on to that mindset and that idea of like, well, you just kind of have to do these things and, and boost the, the resume and set yourself up for the next four years, like the time after. But yeah, reflection and, is so key. And here's something that may help reinforce that. When I was hired into corporate America, um, I, I didn't have the I didn't have any corporate background. I, I was being hired in at a reasonably high level. And the person who hired me and said, I'm hiring you in at this level, even though you don't have a business background, because you are a thinker. He said, remarkably, many, many people do not think you know, reflectively deeply. And so I just think it's an important skill for college students to develop reflection and critical thinking uh, and to not just simply try and build a resume of a, doing a thousand things while you're here. Right. It, it's so much of a place of gaining skills, both like practical, you know, business, like thinking in certain like business areas or, you know, any other major area like that, but also just, yeah, getting better at those life skills of reflection. Absolutely. Now, speaking of reflection, I love asking people, do you have like a memory from high school or your early days of education or schooling that you still kind of think about from time to time? When I think of the first thing I think of when I think of high school is graduation mm -hmm. and the realization I had at that moment that this group of people who had been so important to me for so many years, we would never be together, all of us again. And I, I think that was one of my earlier experiences of, of, of beginning to grasp the limits of mortality, the limits of life, uh, and the fact that you, you don't get to do everything forever. Uh, things end, uh, time is limited, there are forced choices. Um, and so, yeah, that's the moment I think about is when I, I left high school and realized, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing goes on forever. Nothing goes on forever. It is. It's one of the first big moments of that phenomenon. It's the one of the biggest, I think, moments of change that anybody experiences up until that point for the most part. You know, obviously everybody has different stories, but yeah, that moment of graduation and beyond is is definitely probably one of the biggest ones that I've experienced in my life of just shifting things and, and really being aware of those changes and those temporarily, yeah, the mortality of things. Absolutely. Now, the last one I'd love to, to ask you is what would you tell yourself when you first began teaching and actually what would you tell yourself as a first year in college back at that experience so when i first actually when i first started teaching i i was certified in college to teach high school english i never did it i never actually had a, a high school teaching career but i remember um when i was doing my student teaching oh it was a dreadful difficult experience so the thing i would say to myself when i was doing my student teaching as a college student is this day won't last forever um it was just like slogging through those days <laughs> with, with with my high school classes so that was another. And what was what was the second question um what would you tell yourself as a first year student in college like just beginning college and that part of education 
I, I think I just tried to do my best, you know, to, to, and so the message in the morning to myself would be just do your best today. Just do the best you can. Um, it was all new. I wasn't sure what to expect. I wasn't really sure how things were being evaluated. I didn't know where I stood. Am I as, as good as other people? Not as good. You know, so it was like, just just do your best. Absolutely. It's it's the, I think the best way to be, because if you know you did your best, then that's, you can live with that, right? You can always kind of be comfortable at the end of the day with the results because it's like, I did what I, I did what I could. I did my best. Absolutely. Now that brings us to the end of this main interview. The last little question I have, is there anything you'd want to share? Any kind of like thing you want to recommend to the audience to go be interested in or check out or anything like that? No, Oh, but just thank you for the conversation. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it. And then thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate getting to talk to you. It was always wonderful to, to catch up and hear more from the from the professor side of things. I think it's always, you know, you're my first college professor that I've spoken to, but I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh-huh. Well, I'm honored. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm honored. And, and also to the listener, thank you for listening to this episode. Um, professor, do you have any other final words for the audience? How's goodbye? That's a good one. <laughs> goodbye. Wishing you best of luck and best of times in all of your educational endeavors. The student council is adjourned. 